also want to begin by welcoming everyone here this morning. We have been doing these for quite a while, uh, this fall fellowship, but we had a slight break for a while, but now we're back to it. And so I want to take this moment to welcome everyone that chose to be here. You know, it's something that I'll, uh, that will relate to what I'll say later on in this lesson is that the fact that you know, you're here because you chose to be here. And um, it's a... Uh, <laughs> I hope you'll we'll see that tie in later on as to what I have to say. As was said, the title of this lesson is What Does the Lord Require of Us? And if you'll be opening your Bibles to uh, Micah chapter 6, go ahead and go to verse 1. But the specific text for this morning's lesson comes from verses 6 to 8. And that's where I'm going to begin. It says, Wherewithal or wherewith shall I come before the Lord? And bow myself before the high God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. The scripture we've just read is a comprehensive and all-embracing scripture. This is a scripture that also provides us a principle for all of God's children to follow. And in this scripture, Michael raises the question, what does the Lord require of you? So before we begin uh, uh, this examining this passage, I want to first set out two things. First, and that is the context. In Haley's commentary, he sets the scene here as one like a court trial between the Lord and his people. So let's begin at verse 1 and uh, read verses 1 through 3. It says, Hear ye now what the Lord saith. Arise, contend thou before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy, and ye strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with his people, and he will plead with Israel. O my people, what have I done unto thee, and wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. And in verse 4 and 5, the Lord reminds them of the good he has done for them in the past. So whether it be Micah speaking here or Micah speaking for the people, he asks about just how will the people come before the Lord. Now secondly, I think it's good for us to take a moment to understand what does the word require mean. Well, this one word hangs the heart of our lesson. The American Heritage Dictionary of the English language said required or defines require rather in three ways. First, require is to have a requisite or necessity, a need or a pin. You know, for example, fish need water to survive. Number two, require means to stipulate as obligatory by authority. Now our God and Father offers us salvation for our sins, and forgiveness is what we can receive from Him. Because when we sin, we violate his authority. But because he is the only one that can offer salvation and forgiveness, he is the one who gets to set the terms for receiving forgiveness and salvation. He gets to determine what one is required to do in order to meet the terms of the agreement and receive salvation and forgiveness. The third definition for require is to demand as obligatory or appropriate. Your Lord, who is your authority, has requirements for you. Because he has authority over you, and you, oh, because he has authority over you, he has the authority to require things of you that are obligated, that you, rather, are obligated to perform in order to be in compliance. The Hebrew word used here for require is daras, and Strong's defines it as to tread or frequent, usually to follow, for pursuit or search. By implication, it means to seek or ask. Specifically, to worship. Uh, in Thayer's, um, that was Thayer's definition, uh, excuse me. Uh, the, the number six of Thayer's definition is to ask for, require, or demand. Now, Micah answers his own question and makes some important points. Not only for the sake of Israel for their day, but also for the benefit of the Lord's church today. Because remember, in Romans 15 and verse 4, we are told that whatsoever things were written aforetime, 
that being in the Old Testament, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So as we seek to learn from this passage, let's first consider a few questions. First, what did the Lord require of Israel? Well, what did Israel think? Well, Micah offers some possibilities and even some uncertainty. Well, they thought, should they offer year old burnt calves? Or year old calves and burnt offerings? Should they offer thousands of rams? Should they offer 10,000 rivers of oil? Should they offer their firstborn child? You notice with each one of these things that they thought that they should or that they would offer, that the thing offered becomes more and more precious with each one than the one before. And Haley, in his commentary on the minor prophet, has this to say. He says, in their reply to the prophet, that being Micah, they reveal an ignorance of the true nature of Jehovah and what he requires. He also says that it seems that they are willing to do anything except what Jehovah requires of them. Also observe that God indeed did indeed speak of some of these things already, like offering of calves and rams in Leviticus 1, 2 verses 13. Also, the concept of offerings was not anything that was new to these people. You know, Cain and Abel made offerings. You know, when uh, Noah set foot on dry ground, first thing he did was make an offering. But the absurd amounts of oil and the offerings of the firstborns are examples of hyperbole. That is an exaggeration that's not meant to be taken literally. And this is done for the sake of emphasis. Haley, also in his commentary, uh, says that they had forgotten the law of their God and that they are ignorant on how to approach him. And from the context, it's obvious that ritualistic sacrifices alone do not please God. But one cannot please God by just simply offering innumerable sacrifices, even things that were precious to the worshiper. For religious rituals to be properly, that are properly ordained of God to be accepted, they must be accompanied by other things just as essential. Consider Psalms 51, verses 16 through 17, where it reads, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Now let's consider what God required of Israel. He required Israel to do justly. Haley in his commentary says that to, ju to do justly is to act toward God and man according to the divine standard of righteousness revealed in his law. Our modern dictionaries offer several insights into the meaning of the word justly. I'd like to go list a few of those at this time. First, justly is having a basis in or conforming to fact or reason. Justly is conforming to a standard of correctness. Justly is acting or being in conformity with what is morally upright or good. In a just manner, in conformity to law, justice or propriety, by right, honestly, fairly, accurately, and in a fair or morally correct way. This certainly involved the offerings of the sacrifices God commanded. However, it also involved treating their fellow man in a way that was right and fair. It was a failure to do justly that was one of the main reasons Israel went into captivity. Zechariah verses 7, 8 through 14, and chapter 8, 16 through 17. 8 through 14 reads, And the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, and show mercy and compassion to every man to his brother. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. And let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. But they refuse to harm him, and pull away the shoulder, and stop their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law, and the word which the Lord of hosts hath sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it has come to pass that as he cried, and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them, and no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. In Zechariah chapter 8, verses 16 and 17 reads, 
These are the things that ye shall do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. And let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. And love no false hope. And for all these things that I hate, saith the Lord. With these things in mind, I believe it's that to do justly requires that we obey God, that we keep his commandments and do his will. You know, God said to Moses in regards to the house of Jacob and the children of Israel in Exodus 19, verse 5, he says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a, particular, a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And Samuel told Saul in 1 Samuel 15, 22, he says, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. To obey God and keep his commandments and do his will requires that we submit to his will. James 4, verses 7 and 8 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Hebrews 12, 9 through 10 says, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Israel is also told to love mercy. This means, by, according to Haley, to show a compassionate, warm-heartedness warm -heartedness towards man. Cambridge Dictionary says of mercy that it's kindness that makes you forgive someone, usually someone that you have authority over. Time, uh, mercy is an event or a situation that you are grateful for because it stops something unpleasant. And that mercy is kindness shown towards someone whom you have the right or power to punish. You know, uh, we're not only to treat others fairly, but we're also to show mercy towards others. You know, one reason we're to love mercy is because God himself delights in showing mercy. Micah 7, 18 through 19 reads, who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again, he will have compassion upon us, he will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Christ taught one must be merciful in order to receive mercy. In Matthew 5, verse 7, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. In Luke chapter 6, verses 35 and 36, it says, But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the, uh, he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. But ye therefore mercy, be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. And we see in James 2 and verse 8, 12, or starting in verse 8, skipping to 12 and 13, the result of withholding mercy from someone. It says, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. And down in verse 12 and 13, it says, So speak ye, and so do. As they that shall be judged by the law of liberty, for he shall have mercy, for he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. Israel is also told to walk humbly with God. Is required of them. And this involves living in humble and submissive obedience to his desire and will, as stated in Haley Commentary. Again, the Cambridge Dictionary defines humility as the quality of not being proud because you are aware of your bad qualities. And also the feeling or attitude that you have no special importance that makes you better than others. A lack of pride. A lack of pride. 
It can only happen when we recognize the absolute holiness, humility, and humbleness, that is, can happen when we recognize the absolute holiness and righteousness of God. In Haley's commentary, it is humble of heart and spirit that greatly pleases God. Isaiah 57 and verse 15 says, For thus saith the high and lofty, the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. In Isaiah 66 verses 1 and 2, Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. James 4 and verse 6 says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Now, humility is a character that we need to cultivate. In James 4 and verse 10 it says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. When Christ made the behavior of the Pharisees a lesson in humility when he taught the multitude and his disciples in Matthew 23, verses 11 and 12. He says, But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Notice in those scriptures, again, that humility is something that has to be cultivated. It's something that we have to make ourselves to do, that we have to develop. <clears throat> These three, these three things, to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God, God required of those who would come before him, not instead of ritual observances, but in conjunction with them. Matthew 23 and verse 23 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done. And to not leave the other undone. It's not one or the other, but it's both. <coughs> now let's apply this uh, text to us, to, to Christians of today. What does the Lord require of us? What are some things that people of today face? Well, some might think that all the Lord requires is ritual observances, things like attending Sunday worship assemblies. You know, we, uh, it, that's the most important thing. As long as you're in church on Sundays or whenever you're supposed to be there, then, then you're doing what you're supposed to. But, you know, one has to do this. But that's not all that has to be done. You know, sometimes uh, you, you wonder, do people really believe that? Do they believe that just being at church is all that a person needs to do to be accepted for God? You know, that might be the impression that we receive, and that is an often an answer the brethren will get. But, Yes, it's very important to attend your Bible classes and worship assemblies of the church. That is of the most importance. But it's also essential to obey God. Hebrews 10, verse 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. <coughs> you know, it's, uh, attending the services is required if we're to grow spiritually. Hebrews 10, verses 24 to 25 says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. You know, it's, um, the failure to attend every service is displeasing to Lord God. Ephesians 5, 15 and 17 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And when we're absent, are we making the most of our time? But really, how is the time spent elsewhere, other than at the worship service? What are you doing in that time that's more important anyway? You know, Think about that for a moment. You know, if you choose to be somewhere else when you're supposed to be at the worship service, what is it that you're doing that's really more important than worshiping the Lord, than 
pray to help in fulfilling your obligations and duties to the Lord, for making yourself, uh, for, for helping yourself to grow spiritually. You're taking yourself away from that environment that would help you to grow. You know, there's a saying in gardening called the right plant in the right place. You know, you don't put any plant in any place. You put it in a place where it's meant to be, where it will grow and where it will thrive. And if you're, if you're uh, divorcing yourself from the worship service, how will you grow spiritually? You're not in that environment where you need to grow. So do we really believe our absence is what the Lord's will for us is? You know, absence from a worship service can explain the lack of several things. As just mentioned, the lack of spiritual growth. It, will, uh, it can explain the lack of commitment in the work of the church. It explains the lack of close fellowship with God and other Christians. You will not grow in those things if you are not in the environment where those things are meant to grow. Now, I think many of us believe that being a good person, showing goodness to our fellow man, is all that's really needed to be pleasing to God. I think if you ask a lot of people today, what is it that we need to do to be pleasing to God? I think those are the kinds of things that people believe you need to do. You know, I think many people believe God's grace will take care of the rest. You know, that's the excuse that God's grace, that we let that be an excuse to appease our minds and also cover ourselves for a lack of discipline. You know, we look at the ability to keep our mind in subjection as if it's something that we're really not able to do, something that's out of our control. But again, it was, uh, was stated earlier in our lesson, consider 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. There is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. Now this scripture is one of consolation, but it's also one of hope and mercy. It reassures, us, it reassures us that there is really nothing that we will encounter that we cannot overcome. It demonstrates God is a merciful God because he will not allow us into a position we cannot handle. He will not require of us more than we can handle. So, what does the Lord require of us? Well, just like the children of Israel in Micah's day, we as a people have forgotten the law of our God. And many have not even bothered to learn it. And many are ignorant of what God requires of them. What God required of Israel then is the same as what he requires of us now. He, God requires us to do justice, to act toward God according to his divine law. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. In Colossians 3, 17, it says, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. We are, to act according, we are to act according to man, or we are, at, excuse me, we are to act toward man according to God's divine law. Ephesians 4, 25 and 29 says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. We rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. We are today, like uh, the children of Israel, to love mercy. We are to show a compassionate, warm heartedness to our fellow man. To the widows and fathers, James 1 27, pure, pure religion. And undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. We're also even show that warm heartness toward our enemies in Luke chapter 6, verses 35 through 36, where it says, But love your enemies, and do good, and then, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and you shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. And like the children of Israel, we're to walk humbly with our God. And the only way to enjoy His fellowship and continual the way we're to do this is to enjoy His fellowship and continual cleansing by the blood of Jesus. 
James 4 and verse 8 tells us, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double minded. 1 John 1 7 through 9. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To be in close communion and fellowship with God requires from us daily that we should listen to God, that we should be studying his word and learn his will. James 1, 21 says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness and the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. And in verse Peter 2, verse 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, which you may grow in your body. Daily, we are to talk to God. We are to pray for strength and forgiveness. Praise Him for blessings received. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We are to walk with God daily by doing his will in humble submission. Ephesians 5, 2. And walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Ephesians 5, 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. In Ephesians 5, 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So even though we're living under a different covenant today than those of the children of Israel, the Lord still requires us to be justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Our activities that we do with respect to our worship are different today, but the basics are still the same. So the question is, are you doing what the Lord requires of you? Consider these things. Have you done justice by obeying the gospel of Christ? Do you love mercy that is demonstrated by accepting God's mercy offered in Christ? Are you walking humbly with your God by living a dedicated and obedient life? If not, then all the church services you may have attended, all the sermons you may have heard, and all the prayers you may have offered will not benefit you. Consider Luke 4, verse 6, and verse 46, where it says, And why call ye me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Thousands and thousands, millions of people around this world say, Lord, Lord, but don't do the things that he says. But it's not going to be of any benefit just to say, Lord, Lord, and not do what is required of you. Matthew 7, 22 and 23 says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils? In thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You may believe that you've been meeting God's requirements, but if you've not received his mercy and been baptized, it's all for nothing. Mark 16, 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Acts 2, 38 says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In Acts 19 and verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And what did they hear? What caused them to be baptized? Well, they heard that, they, that the baptism that they had received was not the one that was accepted. And when they learned that they were truly not baptized in the Christ, they made the necessary changes. You know, in doing some preparation for this lesson, I 
I rely on my Bible app and the search function. And I put in the, like the word baptized. And I will try it sometimes. Put in the word baptized and just go to the New Testament. Just see how many scriptures have the word baptized in it. And then try to say, try to think, you know, baptism is not important. And then scripture after scripture after scripture has the word baptized at some point. So, like Ananias said to Act, I saw in Acts 22 and verse 16, he says, why, Now, why tarries thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So, to conclude this lesson, let's all, in all earnest, all earnestness, do what the Lord requires of us. Thank you.